there and welcome to Frontiers of Innovation, a LinkedIn Live initiative brought to you by Canon. Now we're absolutely delighted that you've all joined us. Thank you for being with us this week. I see from around the region and indeed from around the world, I see lots of people signing in from different countries. Thank you so much. I'm Ethna Trainer, and I'm going to be your moderator for this whole series of programs. Of course, a series dedicated to innovation, creativity, and how digitalization is impacting our world and just about everything we do. So in the coming weeks, Frontiers of Innovation is really going to take a look at the fast-paced changes that are impacting our world. So be sure and stay with us every Wednesday. Now, we want you all to be involved, so make sure you listen to our speakers Think about what's going on, jot down a few questions, and about uh, in half an hour, we'll be ready to go to the audience and make sure that we hear from you and we get your questions absolutely essential. Be sure and let us know who you are, where you're calling in from, and we'll give you a bit of a shout out on that. And today, of course, our discussion, which I know many of you have been looking forward to, as I have too, is the future of education. So I'm absolutely delighted to have with us our panel for this session. And we're thrilled, of course, to have with us the Chief Education and Innovation Officer from GEMS, of course, one of the leading school providers here, a major company. Mick Yernan joins us now. So, Mick, we're going to talk to you in just a few minutes, but thank you so much, Mick Yernan, with us there. Also, from the founder and CEO of All Academy, yes, that's right, All Academy, uh, Raya Bin Shahri. So, Raya, of course, is joining us too, and we're going to hear a lot too about what she's doing. So. Raya Bidcharty, thank you so much for being with us. And also Ashwin um, Asimul is with us too. He's a partner with LEK Consultancy. So a great lineup, some people who really know what's going on in this area. And when we look at education, of course, it's something that's near and dear to everybody's heart and everybody has an opinion on it. But I'd like to start with uh, Mick Gernon, if I can. And Mick, you've been really at the forefront of everything that's going on here, really frontliners in terms of what's been happening over the last few months, just bring us up to date and talk to us in terms of how the region, Dubai and beyond where GEMS has a key role. How have you actually been coping and what are maybe some of the things you've learned that perhaps will be with us for the future? Great, well, very good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, Nick, uh, for the introduction and for the question. I have to say March seems a long time ago, um, but we've now been stuck in this remote learning period for some time. Um, however, I think as a region, we were, we were very, very well prepared, I think. I remember being thrust onto the first Dubai iRadio show, show on the day that the closure and the lockdown was announced. Um, and there were two other panelists there. But again, they got very clear views in terms of what they were going to do and how they were actually going to cope with the pandemic uh, and respond accordingly. Um, as GEMS, we've been working on sort of digital transformation for some time. So I suppose our transition over to this um, was relatively smooth. We, we did learn lessons. There were some things that went very well, some things that maybe didn't, and I'll allude to shortly. Um, but all in all, we were planned. We I looked at this, um, I suppose, from January onwards, because clearly the world around us was beginning to close down. Uh, we used our networks extensively into China, into Hong Kong, into Singapore, looking at some of the lessons learned from there and then say, how could we actually do this? Um, so all of our schools focus very heavily on a remote learning plan. So we were clear about uh, what teaching would look like. And it's fair to say uh, that not all provision from all providers was exactly the same. Okay? So I think there were subtle differences between what people were actually doing. We fo focused ours very much around live sessions, around whole class, around small group collaboratives, and then around personalized and individualized work that would support students. Other people got live lessons moving uh, through whether it was PowerPoints and narrating those, other people used just purely asynchronous work. So there's a whole mixture. And I think as the whole picture evolved and people have looked around and seen what other people are doing, I think we've probably now come to a consensus around a balance between synchronous learning live sessions that are actually being broadcast, live interaction between me as a teacher and our students, and then the right balance and the right type of asynchronous work that really does stretch people's skills, thinking, ability, in order then to bring that back when they're actually in front of their teacher. So from the, the, the technology piece, that was great for, as I said, we've invested something like $500 million, I think, over the last 10 years in terms of technology 
Uh, we've now created our, some of our own platforms, uh, around something called Phoenix, um, and so that's been used. Our winner on this one was that we didn't change any piece of technology. Now, I think when lots of other people were entered into this, they looked around, lots of EdTech providers said, here you go, have free access, and it was almost like a sweet shop. We said in order to continue, we wanted to make sure that students and parents were using the same technology that they used during the normal schooling period. And that for us really did help us. It helps a very, very smooth transition. Now, then as a result of that, you know, we've surveyed our parents, uh, we've got a 95% satisfaction rate. So we know we must be doing something right uh, within all of this. And indeed, I think we've been hearing great feedback, particularly in terms of all of the students and indeed the teachers, because it's been a very, very collaborative effort and a lot of, I think, creativity, innovation, and all of that put into play uh, and probably escalated a little bit. Um, Ria, when we look at what's going on in terms of education, we look at our academy and we're going to unfold very much what you're doing in this in the next hour. Of course, people have become very familiar with what you're doing, very, very impressive. I mean, you agree that education has always been innovating in many ways, but sometimes you think perhaps it's been innovating on an old industrial model that actually have been broken for a while. I think I read that somewhere in terms of what you said. Tell me, where do you see the future and where does the innovation really have to start? Yeah, so I think when we talk about innovation and education, we often focus on the technology piece. Even during the time of the COVID pandemic, a lot of the heavy lifting was within the technology side. And when you look at investments into new educational models and new educational platforms, those are often uh, branded as ed tech investments. That's where a lot of the heavy venture capital is. Uh, but when we think of education and innovation, we often also have to consider innovation within curriculum, within content, teaching practice, practices, uh, within the learning spaces, within even things like the timetable and when students learn and why they learn. So there's a lot of room for innovation across all those layers. And from my experience as an education entrepreneur, those spaces that often don't fall under the technology don't receive the same kind of funding and attention across the board. Um, they don't sound necessarily as sexy, right? So they don't get as much attention. Um, however, one of the experiences I found uh, during the COVID pandemic is, you know, as Mick said, there hasn't been one approach. A lot of different schools have been doing it differently, which is the way to go. Uh, but what's interesting is to hear how many people talk about you know, potential increased disengagement levels. Uh, you know, some of the parents I've spoken to have been like, oh, students are disengaged, they're not as excited. And the question I ask them is how engaged were they, were they previously, right? Because in many cases, we've just digitized content that may be low relevant, maybe outdated, and just put it on a screen. Uh, if you kind of digitize the same pedagogy, uh, it's going to be futile. We can't possibly expect it to be better. So that's one of the fears I have out of this experience is that a lot of people come out of it blaming distance learning or blaming e-learning, where in fact, it's the underlying uh, ways we've been doing it, uh, whether it's digital or, or, or offline, that is actually broken. When we look around the world, um, Ashwin, and we're going to see, I think everybody will be taking stock on this probably right now, um, looking at the private sector, looking at the public sector in different countries. Some people didn't have the same opportunity. So there'll be a lot of, uh, you know, looking back, of course, and they'll be seeing what we can do better in the future. But who do you think are sort of who's at the forefront of this? Because we look and we see generation by generation, more people are getting educated, but a lot more focus happening now in the private sector. And you say that that's actually a really good thing. Yeah, I, th I think for us, uh, we we're lucky at LEK to work across the world uh, in education, serving governments, private institutions, investors into education. And I think um, many times um, investment and the sort of concept of for profit in education is seen as something that is almost slightly vulgar. But if you look at um, any part of the world, the innovation that we see in education, whether it's at pre K schooling, higher education, um, is actually being developed in the private sector. Um, and they are coming up with ideas to help improve not only access, but also quality and relevance. So these are things that we've seen across the whole education value chain. And you know, it's, it, it's very difficult to answer that question, whereas to say which region or which country is 
has sort of won the is, is first in the race. It actually depends from country to country. There are operators and providers within each of these regions that are doing really, really good work around delivering you know, great quality education using technology, but not, as, as Mick said, not relying totally on it. it. It's still eventually about the quality of the teachers, the quality of the approach um, to teaching. Um, and, you know, the curriculum is, is what it is, but it's the way that you bring that curriculum alive. And again, Mick uh, and Raya are probably more uh, in a better place to talk about that than I am. Indeed. Um, talk to me, Mick, about, you know, we don't want to see the concept of the digital divide. We don't want to see a concept of good schools and bad schools because, you know, it's just, it's not affordable. It's not accessible. Really education. And we look at some of the sustainable, the UN sustainability goals too. And it is really, it's about making sure that education is one of these absolute rights for people around the world. How can we make sure that we have sort of future-proof education, but we can deliver it to everybody and make it more accessible. Does technology, does innovation, does that have to be expensive and out of reach or can we actually make sure that this is attainable for everybody? Yeah, I think I think just on the last point, does it have to be expensive? Um, no, it doesn't, no, not whatsoever. I think where, where, where we are with this whole sort of ed tech debate and, and Raya touched on this as well, um, there's a huge investment that's actually happened in ed tech, as though it's a panacea, and it's not. Um, the, the most important thing for me as an educator is to have a clarity of vision over what should a learner look like for the future, and how do we then prepare them for that? And as Ryan and Ashwin have both said, we're in a system that doesn't quite do that. And so we can spend $5.7 trillion on education as we did last year across the world. 152 billion of that went towards ed tech, but I'd be questioning then what's the impact of that? And what, what I would want to see within, within this um, more equitable world is that we're, we're much clearer about um, equity of access, but then sustainable solutions that sit within those areas that most need it. Um, and you, know, you mentioned you know, sort of some of the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals, et cetera, and what we should be working towards on SDG4. Um, I mean, you, you know, UNESCO has built this global education partnership that brought in 50 different partners to help those in the most greatest of need. Now, when that's happened before, what you've got is a small project that's put in there and everyone says, look at this, this was about this small sector, this small sector, this small sector. What they're trying to do now, I think, is actually look at things that are much more sustainable. So much more in terms of the connectivity, uh, and that doesn't necessarily just mean connectivity from a te technology perspective, but actually access, whether that's TV broadcast, whether that's radio broadcast, as well as you know um, the, the infrastructure around uh, internet access, et cetera, et cetera. But they see as well the, the, the value of developing teacher capability within, these, within this. And I think that's the absolute key to doing this. And if you then take it to the third big flagship that they actually have, it then picks up the gender equality. Um, and we know that in certain areas, you know, the lack of education, that's a real threat to girls in their future and boys in their future as well. Um, and we put people at risk. And there's a great example that they actually had uh, where they're working with Microsoft in Senegal. And I think Senegal has something like 70% um, internet um, penetration. So nearly a third of their population have no access at all. So what they've chosen to do is go in there and identify teachers something like 80,000 teachers that have actually now been trained in terms of the use of technology and certain tools. There's over a million accounts been created for students. There's conversations happening with service providers. They're looking at 3G, 4G, how that can actually happen. And then what they're saying that if we get those bits right, it will be sustainable. So the affordability piece isn't then just left with a single government. It's spread across a number of different providers but actually the most important thing is, is that it's sustainable and it doesn't need the same level of investment year on year on year. If I might stay on that topic at the moment, um, Ashwin, you're working on a very, very comprehensive report looking at education. And I just got a little bit of a, a sneak preview when we talked a little bit about that, where you talk also about the, you know, the SDG4 and really looking at 
you know, challenges that are out there really, and challenges particularly in the developing world. And you've looked at them really in three areas, inadequate access, poor quality, low relevance, and lack of accountability. Is this just a problem in the developing emerging markets or, you know, maybe we should be looking at this around the world too, but let's uh, come back to uh, some of the emerging markets and developing markets. How big an issue is this and how, what can we do to address it? I mean, it is an issue in, in, um, in so many uh, emerging economies and, and the, the issue of access is, yes, funding is an issue, uh, government funding is an issue, but even when there is government funding, you know, issues around getting good quality teachers, well-trained, motivated teachers. Um, you know, there, there may be school buildings in place, but that's not what makes a great school. It's it's the the, the teaching quality um, and the support to those teachers, and the support to the parents to push them to send their, their kids to school uh, and and show them that there's a real return on investment um, to educating your kids, especially in in some of the third world countries and. What we, we've outlined in this report that you, you pointed out, which is something that we've done with the Jacobs Foundation, is again how the private sector has combined with governments to deliver some amazing programs. So again, just to give you some examples, in Nigeria, Bridge International Academies working with uh, the government to deliver and, and, and train 11,000 teachers. Um, and, and, and impact 850 schools uh, and 270,000 pupils. Um, uh, Eaton College, uh, with Eaton College's uh, Tony Little Center, doing some really good um, work around innovation and research in, in terms of learning. Um, the Citizens Foundation in Pakistan, um, in Colombia, uh, the, the work that Alianza Educativa is doing and Rising Academy in Liberia. All of these are great examples of how the private sector is working with the public sector to address these issues around um, access and quality. Um, but I think there's scope for the public sector and the private sector to work more closely together across all um, economies, all countries. Um, so there is, there's a lot of best practice that can be shared. Um, so to answer your question, I, yeah, it's happening, I think, more so uh, in terms of the public-private collaboration in, in emerging economies, and there is scope uh, for that to happen in, in more developed economies as well. Indeed, and I think if there's ever the exact sort of concept of knowledge sharing, the term that we hear so much, I mean, it's definitely has to be knowledge sharing within, I think, on an international level too, on the public-private within the school and within the educational environment, essential. I'm picking up on a word Mick has just mentioned that. I'm going to throw it to you, Raya. He talked about what will the learner of the future look like, but also perhaps what will the teacher of the future look like? And how are you sort of bringing that together now to make sure that you've got the inspirational people who are up there, who are the instructors, who are the people who are imparting knowledge, so to speak. And again, how do you get learners, the young learners, get those minds possibly more motivated? Plenty of them will come with motivation, but how do you sustain that and make sure that we leave nobody behind and bring everybody in? Yes, one of the first challenges we faced at All Academy was specifically the lack of this educator of the future. So when we first launched, our main focus was to you know, teach students with the skills, values, and mindsets that we felt like were missing with traditional core curriculum, but were absolutely required for them to not just thrive in the workforce, but have a positive impact on humanity. And as we were you know, creating this new future-focused curriculum and implementing it at various schools at our, at our own All Academy Learning Hub, we found that it was extremely challenging challenging to find educators that could lead such a future focused curriculum that was completely interdisciplinary, that was completely focused on skills and competencies of the future. Uh, you know, teachers are simply not trained for this. They're usually trained to be sub subject specialists that prepare students for an exam, right? Whereas we needed uh, educators that could inspire, that could facilitate engaging lessons, that could teach moonshot thinking one day and ethical use of technologies the next, where they had this interdisciplinary mindset. And so this was one of the core challenges. And what we found is often the best educators are not necessarily, in some cases, they're you know, inspiring teachers within the system, but in other cases, they're individuals uh, who have this kind of growth mindset and uh, natural pedagogical intelligence with an interdisciplinary background that you could train to facilitate a session. So we had to be creative about who our teachers were. Um, in terms of how you motivate learners, uh, 
at the Learning Hub, we piloted you know, personalized learning pathways, where instead of giving students a prescribed curriculum, we gave them the option of identifying a challenge in the world or identifying a pathway uh, and designing a solution or a project and learning as they went on that journey. So it started with kind of discovery exercises around finding purpose, finding passion, you know, learning about things like the sustainable development goals, or even really futuristic areas like technology ethics. And from there, designing your own learning playlists that you went through, uh, either individually or with your team throughout six months. And that completely flips the modeling, increases motivation with students, because then you're not learning for an exam. You're learning because you're cur curious about an area or you're learning because you're going to use what you learn to make the world a better place. And uh, really there is no, in my, in my, from my experience, there's no better incentive of learning than that awe and wonder that comes uh, from giving students that choice and autonomy. When I look back and Mick, I'm gonna bring you into this. Um, you know, I don't think there was a whole lot of awe and wonder in my early years in school. Although there was awe and wonder, I suppose, every day because we were learning new stuff. But I think compared to what's going on now, and I think we look at, you know, initiatives like what you're doing with GEMS as well. Just sort of use your own experience in a way in terms of where, where you've been and where you've come to now. And particularly related to, I think, the centers of excellence that GEM have, GEMS have put in place. A very, very different model, but again, a contemporary model, a relevant model, and a, an essential one, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, there's always awe and wonder wherever you go, by the way, and whatever you do. You can always see something positive as <laughs> part of that. I, I think, you know, Ryan has touched on, on that very, very well, that, um, you know, that the, the, the curriculum and the diet that is currently delivered in schools is the same curriculum and diet that's been there for X number of years. Yeah, and those curricula were actually developed for specific purposes, whether it's industrial era, whether it's post-war, whether it's more white collar workers, whether it's more information age, more innovation age, but we've got to now move on to something that, that, that is actually quite different. Um, and I think the, 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 the secret of the future of education touches on, on a number of things that Ryer actually said here, because it's less than about the knowledge that you actually get and the subject content. It's what you do with that to actually be one solution focused, real world focused, so that students are actually engaged in things that will make a difference. And Raya's example is fantastic there. We also have something that we call the Global Innovation Challenge, which is for 60,000 of our students across the world uh, who, are, who are charged with coming up with solutions to some of the world's greatest problems and then pitching them to companies. Um, and many of those ideas are actually accepted and then taken on. So we know that there's a shift there uh, that has to happen. And it has to be around the future of work, the future of skills, and potentially what that would look like. So we've taken, uh, I suppose, all of our models. We run traditional schools, um, as you know. We run schools within that traditional model that maybe are a little bit more far-reaching and innovative and deliver a part of their programs online. And we've just launched within five of our schools uh, a series of centers of excellence that are focused on areas or future areas of technology for the UAE, um, areas where government, where business tells us these are the sorts of things that we actually want from young people. These are the sorts of areas that you, we want you to train them in and develop their skill sets and mindsets. So we've got a center that focuses, for example, on AI and uh, emerging technologies. We have one that's focused on aviation and space. Um, another one that's entrepreneurship focused. Another one that is based on digital industries. Uh, and a fifth one at the moment that looks at performance and event technologies. All very, very relevant. But the, the, the difference about them, it's not just a, um, what I should say this, uh, lots of schools have had specialism to say, you know, we're good at sports or we're good at arts. We're good at it. This is about creating a new curriculum and it's not about examinations, but it is, as Raya said, about pathways. So each of our centers have actually got a number of business partners and a university partner that sits with them. And the idea behind the center is that we then begin to blur what are traditional age boundaries uh, and we're saying, why do you wait till you're 18 to go to university? Why can't you do undergraduate type study and apply it when you're 14 or 15 or 16? Why do you have to go through your university course and then go into your employment? Why can't you go straight into employment and learn some of those things? And with our partners, what we're hoping to get to is a scenario there where we can 
almost abandon the traditional examination. So forget your A-level, forget your IB diploma or your high school diploma, but actually have a series of credentials from those partners that say, actually, this person is now skilled in these areas. Um, and therefore, we put our name behind it, we can credential. Now, we think that is a much better preparation for the world of the future. And we know that jobs are going to change. Uh, they're already changing. There's no one career for life anymore. It's about that learn, unlearn, learn again, be flexible, get the, you know, this whole sort of gig economy that, that, that we need to prepare people for. Schools in the main are not doing that. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to actually say it's about time we looked at the model and not just create little islands where the you know, pockets of excellence where this happens, but actually get those across system-wide as well. So innovation does happen, it can happen. We need to now get it to a point where it can happen at scale, but that needs a change of mindset and it needs a change of what do we truly value from the school and education system. And it shouldn't be examination results. And I know both our speakers want to come in on this. Ashwin, let me stay with you for a minute because when you also think about getting these centers of excellence and getting great schools and then great universities, it comes, you know, it comes at a cost. Investment has to be there. And just by nature, investment is going to want some return on that. So it's got to be outcome focused as well. In your studies and in all of the research and the work that you are doing, are you, do you agree with Mick there in the terms that we're not seeing the skills, I think in some areas, in some sectors we do, but for the most part, you're straight into, you know, out of school, into university, you're back to the books, you've got an academic qualification. And sometimes I hear people in industry say that actually what's coming out of the universities, they're not ready to work. How have you found, what do we think, what do you think we have to do to shift that? Well, it's, it's one of those things, it, this has been happening for decades, right? Universities have, uh, well, employers have been saying universities are not producing um, employment ready candidates. Um, increasingly, universities are saying schools aren't producing um, higher education ready students. So everyone's sort of passing the buck to some extent. Um, I, you know, I think I absolutely agree with Mick that the, um, the focus has to be not on knowledge capture, but learning how to learn, learning how to adapt. Um, there is a move towards, um, you know, a different kind of knowledge capture as well. So there are a lot of different degrees, degrees that even when I was at university 20 years ago, um, didn't exist. Um, and I think, you know, the model will have to change. So this idea that traditionally what university has been, has been a signaling device to employers that Hey, I've done my grind. I've, I've been there. Um, I've gone through some selectivity. The university selected me and I've, I've done my exams and I've got a whatever a first class honors or two one. And it's a signaling device to employers saying, hey, you know, employ me. Do they have all the relevant skills or any of the relevant skills? No, they pretty much learn it on the job. But I think the, the way things need to evolve is given that there's just so much knowledge and information out there. Why can't we replace part of this curriculum in terms of sort of knowledge capture of some of these concepts that are easy to get hold of on, on Google or wherever um, and replace them with you know, really practical skills? And again, I'm, I'm sure you're going to talk about 21st century skills at some point, but around working in teams, um, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, working in, in difficult situations, you know, all of these skills that are very, very important in your career, which you don't really get to, um, to get to learn during your time at school and, and in many cases during your time at university. Um, and Raya, I mean, you have, you've introduced so much of this. I've just looked through actually the 24-week the program, I believe, of future fluencies and beyond impressive. If I had something like that in school, I'd have jumped in it. But at the moment, too, that's supplemental to the traditional learning because what we have in place you know, is certainly still subject and exam focus. So we've got to do that as well. Raya, I want you to come in here and talk to us about your program, because at the moment, probably all of what we're learning now is something we could be learning when we're much, much younger. And you have really put in place a program called Fluent uh, Future Fluencies. I think this is fabulous, a 24 week program that really it's in addition to what kids are learning at school. And it's a real enhancement. Talk to us a little bit about that, because there's some really interesting and mind-opening 
uh, elements within that? How important is it? What's, what's the feedback? What are you hearing from parents and from students? Yeah, so when we first launched the uh, uh, Academy initiatives, we were very focused on being extracurricular. Uh, but what we found is that, you know, there's a lot of innovation happening within that extracurricular space and everyone's fighting for that little bit of room in the timetable to make exciting things happen. So we actually launched the All Academy Learning Hub and the six month program that you're referring to in order to start fleshing out our offerings into the direction of a potential full-time offering one day. Uh, so the current uh, Learning Hub program uh, as it exists really is designed to equip students with the skills, values, and mindsets that we've talked about today. Uh, everything from kind of technical skills down to creativity and innovation and uh, ethical thinking, collaboration, teamwork, learning how to learn, finding passion and purpose. Uh, but above all, we also have integrated industry expert mentorship and regular kind of guest speakers so that students get exposure into the jobs, emerging jobs and industries of the future. And then the final piece is the learning journeys that I spoke about earlier, wherein they work on these interdisciplinary and project-based pathways uh, towards uh, make, pushing humanity forward. And, um, you know, the feedback has been outstanding. And since our first pilot pilot program, uh, we've launched a partnership with the Alpha Tame Education Foundation. We're doing a partnership with ADIC, which is the uh, kind of the educational government body in Abu Dhabi. And overarchingly, uh, students are saying that it fits in a lot of the gaps in their curriculum and that they're learning uh, about areas they were never exposed to in school. And many of them are rethinking their career paths in particular. Uh, that's been one interesting outcome. Uh, but the overarching message here, and I, this is where I completely agree with Mick, is programs like ours or programs like what's happening at the Center of Excellence are amazing, but unfortunately, ultimately, they're 10 to 20 percent of the students' time. Most of their time, about 80 to 90 percent of it, is dedicated to the core um, curriculum uh, focused on the subject knowledge that they have to gain to pass whatever exam at the end of their graduation. And that's a huge problem because that's a massive bottleneck towards, you know, going beyond uh, creating more time in the timetable for students to focus on what's actually important. And uh, another major bottleneck here is actually regulations. And this is where I think governments need to take more initiative. Unfortunately, in many places in the world, if you wanted to do something like the Academy Learning Hub or one of the GEM Center of Excellence as a full-time educational model, it would be illegal. Uh, many governments are still mandating specific like report cards, subject-based knowledge, and uh, kind of specific teaching methodologies and organizing the classrooms by age, for example. And a lot of, a lot of these things that we see in the industrial era model are mandated uh, at a government level or at a regulatory level. So if there's one final thing that I think really needs to change or open up to allow for alternative models of schooling and education, it's regulations. And indeed, whose responsibility in many ways it is? Mick, let me throw this one to you. And um, Ashwin, I'm gonna bring you in on this as well, because when we look at the regulations that's out there, you know, we also need to look, and I think we are seeing um, you know, more employers getting involved, maybe not as many as we want, coming on the boards, being involved in a sort of public-private partnership, talking to education in terms of what they want, what they need. And we're also seeing so many new skills coming on board and employers hiring kids and hiring, just inspiring young people who have great ideas. So will industry perhaps begin to lead the fact that you don't need all these qualifications or, you know, will it be vice versa? Do we have to just look through a sort of blended program and, and I mean I guess we have to learn as we go in this one because it's not set in concrete right now what do you think in the future yeah I, I think you know uh, to your question who's actually going to lead that I think a number of large-scale organizations your sort of glass door companies have already made it very very clear that they want people who can bring a different skill set they don't want people with degrees um, now that's not to say there's no value in a degree of course there's value in degrees but maybe then universities are now beginning to rethink what's the purpose of their degree. And the number of universities we know are sort of rethinking their approaches and again modeling backwards. A number of universities are now saying, well, let's relax some of the requirements that we need from students who are coming from school. You know, even Harvard announced last week that they wouldn't require SATs from next year and join in 1,300 other US universities who actually want to look at more broad based approaches and portfolios of achievement rather than just pure examinations. And you know, I, I think COVID this year has actually proved that. Um, we've got a whole cohort of students for the first time ever 
who were actually going to go into university without having to have, have sat the formal exams. Yet they've been able to demonstrate their prowess both academically uh, and non-academically in so many different ways. And schools have been put on the spot to say, well, actually, prove to us as universities yeah, that, that we, we can actually tell the students. And that's just happening. It's just going to flow. Now, if it can happen now, my contention is it should now influence everything that happens beyond this. And there's a great opportunity there to, to re-examine the billion dollar industry that is our standardized testing and examinations uh, 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 industry out there. And so actually, surely there must be smarter ways of actually assessing students' abilities and capabilities and let them demonstrate what they can do and value that worth rather than the knowledge they regurgitate in an examination. And I think that's absolutely fascinating as somebody, I guess, should be out there, you know, ready to almost you know, study and follow this group that do go into university because it will probably be a once a one off thing. Hopefully we won't be having this situation every year. But the fact that they do go to university, how do they do? They didn't do those exams. It'll be fascinating to see. I want to get to our audience questions because a lot of our viewers out there, I did promise we'll come to you early and we have one. And um, Ashwin, if I can come to you and maybe pick up on what Mick said, but also add this into a question here that we've got from Kevin from Lebanon. Will the e-learning or education from home replace physical schools? And are we really looking at, you know, replacing schools? Do we need universities and institutions, you know, post-COVID? What do you think? Yeah, I think if, um, if you speak to any parent today who's dealt with one term of, um, well, it's not e-learning, it's remote learning, You'll and you're talking your experience too, huh? Yeah, for, for, as a parent and as a, someone who works in education, um, bricks and mortar are here to stay. So the idea that, you know, our future generations are going to get taught on an iPad, not going to happen. Um, the way that our kids, our grandchildren are going to be taught is largely going to be the same way that our grandparents were taught. Um, of course, there will be changes, all of the things that Mick and Raya have been talking about in terms of, the curriculum, the content, but the, the idea of we will still need to get people together. In fact, more, more so than ever, jobs and the skills you require are team-based. Um, so working in teams, working in groups, um, solving problems together will be important, and that can be done best in a school environment. So the idea of online taking away our, our, you know, our bricks and mortar schools, I feel is, you know, it's, it, it's just not going to happen. And COVID is a great reminder to those skeptics who thought, you know, school, we don't need school buildings anymore. Um, I think COVID will, has sort of hopefully reset their minds. Raya, now you of course have online and offline. And just stay with this question. I think it's something I'm going to bring it back to you, Mick, because I think and uh, we have quite a few questions specifically around this because I think it's something that caught everybody's attention. The importance of possibly doing both. Yeah, I, we all always believed in the blended model. Uh, I think there, if there's one thing that we have learned out of this pandemic and the mass remote learning is that there's lots of things that can be done online very effectively, right? We're realizing that when it comes to just acquiring information or practicing certain you know, uh, skills, you can do that very easily remotely, whereas school time should be focused on collaboration and teamwork and socialization, getting feedback and mentorship, that kind of stuff. So I do think that's what should change radically is rethinking what students do at school versus what they do at home. There's no reason for them to be sitting in live lectures, for example, or just con consuming content all day. Uh, they should be doing that at home with their devices and spending time at school working in teams and collaborating on projects. Um, just from my experience, again, speaking to the different students and parents on, on our network, another thing that I will change is that a small but growing body of parents might actually prefer this model. And I say this because I've seen this specifically with either high motivated children or athletic children or kids that have are gifted and have a lot of other things going on is so all of a sudden their parents are just like, we don't want to go back to school. We don't want to go back, back to how things were and are looking for alternatives. Um, they're a small minority. I'm not claiming that's the mass, but I, I, I do believe that we're, there are a growing number of parents who are realizing there are other ways of doing things and maybe fully online or blended model is one of those ways. Um, Mick, I mean, we look at, you know, the education model and sincerely hope that it's not going to go the way of some high street stores, 
that possibly didn't innovate when online shopping came. I mean, it's a very different situation here. But I do think we are still seeing such great investments in schools, and it's something that touches everybody. I think every family, everybody is looking at this. And, you know, as the world becomes uh, more developed and as we see a growth in middle class, I think children's education is probably one of the number one things that we hear from young parents um, and from young married couples looking ahead to having a family, all of that. The focus that's on good and you know relevant education for the children, I think now this has probably become more important in the last maybe 10, 20 years than it was a long time ago. It's a yeah. new world. Yeah, 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 I think so. And I think I, I can just pick up points from both Raya and Ashwin on the, I think what I, the current situation gives us an opportunity to move the needle. You know, and Raya mentioned, you know, blended models coming in and things like that. I think we'll see that happening in schools, yeah? But I think if we, let, let, let me just reverse the question slightly. If COVID was so invasive that it meant that you had to knock down your school building, what would you build or rebuild in its place? And I'm pretty sure we wouldn't build the huge monolith that currently sits there. And so for me, this, is, this gives us an opportunity to um, examine and repurpose and reimagine what the whole schooling experience is and should be for, for the future. Um, because, you know, as you said, you know, are we going to continue to educate our students in exactly the same way that their grandparents were? Um, I think there's a missed opportunity if that's going to be the case. Yeah. Raya picks up about the need for more social and emotional learning and developing those sort of, you know, the self-awareness skills. And really, that's, for me, that's one of the, the, the key aspects of what school is all about, being able to socialise with your friends, being able to network, to work together, to collaborate in groups, you know, all those wonderful things that we actually want to see. But actually, the knowledge piece you can get from the touch of a button. So maybe it's about repurposing the purpose of the building and then looking at actually how can our future learning landscape cope with both face-to-face -face and more um, online uh, learning that, we, that can sit with that. And I think what we should be looking towards and moving towards, and hopefully we will do, is more of a personalised approach where it's the student that's at the heart of this, not the school. So at the moment, the student fits the school rather than the school fitting the student. And Raya, I see you absolutely agreeing with that. Come in on this here because I can you have a lot to say about it. No, I completely agree. Uh, one of the ways that you know we've tried to reimagine spaces with the Learning Hub is we've, instead of building our own space, embedded it into existing innovation hubs, existing workspaces. So for example, our uh, kind of main flagship hub is at the Area 2071, uh, which is this really cool startup like space with governments, corporations, and uh, you know other uh, startups all around you. So students love coming to spaces like that because they're in that network um, and they're in these open spaces, not confined within boxes where they can network and go to events from different uh, kind of providers. So that's another way to reimagine um, learning spaces of the future is why do they have to be these isolated buildings on their own? Why not embed, embed them? Uh, as micro kind of hubs within existing uh, co-working spaces or existing you know, uh, uh, tech companies. So just reimagining uh, that physical silo of the school and where it exists. We have a few questions here and Ashwin, if perhaps you might tackle this one here and a lot around the concept of the globe and people moving to e-learning and more accessibility of topics and um, all of the titles and et cetera. But will the impact, how will this impact actual fees in schools, in private schools, and in universities? And again, when we look at some of the big universities in terms of the rankings and that, you know, they come with a pretty hefty price tag. And not everybody can afford them. Obviously, there's some great scholarships out there. And on that side, I mean, something I think that has to be encouraged as well. But what is the dilemma here in terms of how people will learn and how people can afford to learn? And then you know, that continued investment in absolutely, you know, the best education that's out there. Yeah, I, mean, look, I think um, you know, our view at LEK is that there is definitely um, a place for blended learning. Um, blended learning still requires teachers and professors. And that's, um, you know, these are, these are very 
um, highly talented people. Um, they go to school, they, 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 you know, they need to be paid well to deliver the quality um, that students um, expect and parents expect. So this view that if you moved online, everything should you know, be reduced and discounted significantly um, is one that I don't agree with. Um, you know, of course, if you're doing something that is 100% online, but um, is, 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 is not synchronous, it's, it's just content that you're taking on, um, that's completely different. But as long as you've got teachers involved and you've got counseling involved, which you're gonna need, academic counseling, career counseling, um, there will be um, a significant cost attached to it. And again, it's always, you know, education is an investment. So why do you pay a quarter of a million dollars for a, a degree at Harvard? It's because the employment that you get on the back of it is commensurate with what you pay. Um, and education, wherever it is, whatever it's doing, whether it's at the K-12 level, needs to give parents that sense of ROI. It's very easy to get a view on the return on investment in higher education because you can see the fees and the kinds of salaries people get. But with schools, it is around, again, outcomes, whether it's academic outcomes, university destinations, and increasingly, as, as you know, Mick talked about, the, the centers of excellence and the movement straight into the job market, it will be about how, um, how, how students are able to, to get good jobs straight after school. And again, I think it's ultimately everybody wants, you know, wants what good jobs, the job that they absolutely feel passionate about. We mentioned briefly, and Mick come in on this, I think all of you want to talk about this, 21st century education. I mean, when we look at 21st century education and that holistic concept of education, we've certainly talked around it, but for people who perhaps haven't heard this terminology at home, Mick, what would you, what's your take and your understanding of 21st century holistic education? Uh, okay, very good question, um, because I think it can mean many things to many people at the moment. I, th I, th I think the perceived wisdom is that it's being defined by sets of skills and capabilities in young people and almost like switching the focus away from your subject knowledge to your personal growth and development. Um, and so I think in order to do that, um, our approach to curriculum needs to change, our approach to teaching needs to change our approach to what we truly value uh, from an education also needs to change as well. But they would pick up, you know, it's those opportunities, I suppose, for, you know, we mentioned collaboration earlier on, but this is now, you know, within this digitized world, more around co collaboration across networks. that can be global networks that students could never even have imagined before. Um, it could be solving problems that a company has posted out there to say, we need solutions on X, Y, Z. So I think it's moving more towards that around the relevant side. And I come back to something I said early on, why are we educating and why are we teaching what we do? Um, you know, normally the curriculum follows a social purpose, you know, whether it was you know, war recovery or whatever it would be. What's our purpose for the future? Uh, and I think in defining that, then that should actually help us redefine and reimagine what learning should look like and then ultimately what the schooling systems should be that then sit around that. Raya, stay with this concept of 21st century holistic education. What's your interpretation of this? So adding on to everything that Mick said, for me, it's also about the model of education uh, involved. So for me, 21st century education means that instead of boxing it into subjects, you have interdisciplinary themes, uh, where instead of assessing students through exams, you're instead assessing them through their impact on the world or their development of these critical 21st century skills and competencies, where, you know, uh, instead of having the schools be a, a place of them consuming knowledge, it's a place of collaboration and feedback. Uh, so for me, 21st century education in its ideal form uh, goes around these characteristics that we've been really discussing throughout this webinar. Um, and Ashwin, I know you're very passionate about this. And again, it's something that you've studied a lot in your research. What are you hearing from all of the key players and the case studies that you look on in terms of what is 21st century education going to look like? Yeah, I mean, for me, Mick and Raya are probably best place to answer the question. But when we speak to employers, when we speak to parents, um, what do we when want? Yes. Operators, it's really about um, how do you make students ready for, uh, the, for the, the world that they're going to be graduating into. So 
um, you know, again, we, we see interesting um, models around knowledge capture. Um, you know, you, you see universities developing different kinds of courses, but at the school level, it's really around developing students that are resilient, uh, that can work well in teams, that can solve problems, um, that are internationally mobile, uh, that understand um, the differences in different cultures. Um, and, and again, there's lots of books written about this, but, but essentially it's, it's basically producing um, adults that are ready to function um, in this changing, evolving um, world, both professionally and personally. There's so many areas that we can discuss on this and we have only a short time left. So I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up, but I'm gonna almost throw a few questions in there in your wrap up you can maybe take, put attention to. The comment from Divya here in uh, Dubai also talking about the fact that internet connection around the world has gotten so better. And I imagine she's also looking at, you know, rural areas and developing countries. So therefore, you know, more access to multimedia than we have from uh, Samir here talking also about the fact that having more access to multimedia, our kids not going to spend their time more looking at their screens and getting caught up in that rather than um, perhaps maybe moving out to be more interactive. And again, how is that going to impact, you know, their mental development as well? So perhaps a few of these themes just in a wrap up and perhaps if I, uh, Raya, take from you first and just uh, what are your hopes and dreams for the future in this sector? And we've only got a minute or two to put that together. Sure. So I'll address one of the themes first. Um, I ch always challenge parents to not think about screen time, but rather the balance between consumption time and creation time. So it, yes, it can be problematic uh, if a young mind is constantly sitting uh, in front of their iPad and watching YouTube videos all day. Uh, but instead, what if they balance that out with actually using their device to create digital works of art or uh, creating content or creating YouTube videos, right? So I let's not necessarily just think about limiting screen time, but actually how we use that screen time or leverage it in positive or negative ways. Uh, but my hope for the future is that we stop thinking of education as a tool to just prepare students for university or for jobs, but actually as a tool for what we call positive civilization level change. Uh, it's kind of what Mick touched on earlier, which I agree with, is we need to start asking ourselves, what kind of a world do we want to live in? Uh, what are the characteristics, dispositions, and skills that citizens of this world have? And how can we work backwards from there into designing a curriculum that actually prepares uh, future citizens for this globalized world in terms of pushing humanity forward? That's ultimately, that should be what education is about. And I think if education providers started asking themselves that question at a high level and then designing models around it, uh, we'd be living in a much better world. Ashwin, I'm really looking forward to reading this report in full. A lot of work I know has gone into that with yourself and your colleagues in that. But again, your almost findings of this report in terms of what do we need to do when we look at the next step for the future and the sustainability of good education. Um, for, for, for us, I think this, the, the, what good will look like, there's so much that needs to change. But one of the hopes that I have, coming back to your earlier question, question Edna, is governments will work more closely with the private sector to gain some of the best practices, some of the learning, some of the innovation. So access is a key problem. Someone spoke about it earlier in terms of one of your questions. Well, actually the, the, the private sector does have some great um, solutions and ideas um, to help countries across the world uh, with, with gaining access, but it's not only about access, it's about quality and it's also about relevance. So, um, I hope over the next five to 10 years, the public sector and the private sector really combine quite closely and collaborate um, to deliver just a better quality of education for everyone um, that's being served. Yeah, and I think that, yes, indeed will be good for everyone. Mick, I'm going to leave you the last word here. I know you're also wrapping up um, a very, very eventful first half of the year for GEMS and that you probably won't have too much this summer as you, I know that the dates about going back to school have been announced here in Dubai. But when we look ahead, um, you know, what will you think are the big learning outcomes and are you ready to tackle the next academic year? Um, yeah, I mean, just on the last point, yeah, we know that we've got to create something that's a little bit different and can flex and go with whatever the local situation uh, is going to be. And I think that's not just here in Dubai, but it's across the world. I think the, the degree of flexibility is, is absolutely key on that. 
Moving forward, um, I just want to pick up uh, two words that Ashwin picked on, which are absolutely spot on, around, you know, education moving forward should be about quality and relevance, but not just about seat time. It's actually about what they actually do with that. And, you know, and to one of your questions earlier on around the internet is everywhere and access is growing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, a future of education, I normally talk about seven pillars. I'm not going to do that now, but I'm going to pick one, which is about time and place. And really to actually have a system then that is no longer about eight till three and we go home five days a week and we only work half of the year, but actually why can't that system be demand led by students, um, uh, be operational 24 seven, um, and therefore open learning up and not constrain it into what was traditional approaches. Some of those advances there, I think would make a real difference to moving the system forward rather than just individual schools. So a lot to think about, a lot to do, and a lot of great possibilities, I think, if nothing else. That's what I'm hearing from all of you. I think it's a, a time of disruption and a time of you know innovation, creativity. So it's bound to be perhaps a little bit messy at the moment. But I think the great thing is everybody is talking about it. Everybody is looking at it. Everybody, again, looking to the future to see what you know the great opportunities that can be there for the teachers, for the educational system, and above all, of course, for the students that are going to be the leaders of the future. We're going to have to wrap it up there. Mick, Raya, Ashwin, thank you all so much for being with us. It's been a real joy. I've loved listening to you. I'm sure everybody else is indeed at home too. And thank you so much for your input, for sharing your experience and your expertise. And to all of you at home, thank you so much for keeping in touch. Thanks for your questions. We didn't get around to all of them, but we're really, really grateful that we did have you involved too. And of course, next week, this time next week, we'll be back live at five here in Dubai two o'clock in the UK and Ireland, um, make sure that you do join us because we're going to be looking at the Agile workforce. So on Wednesday, the 1st of July, we'll be back here live on five on LinkedIn. So for me and all of the team at Canon, really looking at frontiers of innovation, we're here to serve you, to have these discussions, to see what we can actually involve the wider community of. And we're really grateful that you've taken the time to join us. Once again, to my dear panel today, a big thank you.